Okay, here we go. We're going to try again. Boris's Brexit map. Part two. So, Robert, two weeks ago we tried to map Boris Johnson's options to get us through the Brexit. A model of clarity. Morass, a model of clarity, as uh, our viewers can see here before us. You know, time's been ticking. It's now only 20 days to the October 31st Brexit deadline. But a lot has actually changed since we last spoke. So should we have another go we'll and do try this to again. work out what happens I don't next? Think, I don't think there's anything in here that, that has yet proved to be wrong, but that we have got more information. Okay. So let's have another so go. Let's move on, let's move on, let's move on. The things that we definitely do know, OK, the deadline, 31st October. And then before that, the 19th of October. So here we are, 11th, 12th. And then there's the summit on the 16th, yep. EU summit. So, it looks like here, here we all are, we actually have more of a chance of a deal than no deal, or certainly than last time we spoke. It's cheered up a bit because it's discussions between the UK and, and cheered, Ireland. It's definitely cheered up this week. Mm. Uh, it looked really grim for most of the week. And then Boris Johnson and Leo Varadkar met in uh, the Wirral on Thursday. And to a lot of people's surprise, I think, the noises out of it were much more positive. Varadkar said he saw a pathway to a deal, which is obviously not the same as a deal. One analyst I saw raised the chances from 5% to 10%. So wow. we should keep some <laughs> sense of perspective. But we will know, I think, within the next 24, 48 hours, whether the European Union thinks there is enough movement for it to be worth starting to negotiate. So it's it's far too early at the moment to say there's going to be a deal, but it looks a little less unlikely than it did earlier this week. But no deal is definitely still alive as a possibility. So sticking to the deal for now, there's the question of whether Boris Johnson can strike a deal with the EU that satisfies both the Republic of Ireland and the Northern Ireland Unionists, the DUP, and his own right wing, and possibly tempt across 20 to 30 Labour MPs to support it in the House of Commons. How on earth do you get a deal that satisfies all those groups of people? Because their needs are mutually exclusive. Or do you think just the pressure of getting further along this timeline is making people more likely to compromise? Well, I don't know the answer. I'm Getting a deal that everybody can sign up to is really difficult, especially a deal that the Democratic Unionists and the Republic of Ireland can sign up to. And we know how hard that is because we watched the Good Friday Agreement and we know how long it took. And almost by definition, the moment one of those sides is happy, the other one's unhappy. So it is very tricky. We know Boris Johnson talked to Arlene Foster and the DUP before his meeting with Varadkar. So whatever concessions he has put forward, he must at least have talked to the DUP about them and felt able to to go a bit further. So we shall see. The numbers remain absolutely horrible and incredibly tight. And I think there are two dynamics here, one of which is that there are all these people just desperate not to leave without a deal mm. and don't really want an election where no deal could become viable at the end of it. Absolutely. And then the others who think, but if we sign up to this deal, it's Brexit, it's happened, and our hopes for a referendum, our hopes of getting this reversed are gone. So the numbers in Parliament are horribly tight. The referendum is an interesting point, and I know you think this has got more likely. I do. So one thing that we have left off our sort of groups of he the people he has to satisfy, actually, apart from the EU, which I'd definitely add, is also this, um, the sort of One Nation Tories, mm. who are extremely concerned that if we get to a general election where Brexit has not been resolved either through an election or th uh, a referendum or some other means, that the Tory party manifesto will make it possible for them to claim after the election that they have a mandate for no deal. Yeah. So, that, so that one of the things that's happened since we last spoke is that this group has become much more vocal in trying to put pressure on number 10 on the subject yeah. of no deal. The other thing that I think is really interesting is that the chances of all of these groups in Parliament who essentially don't agree on what should be in a Brexit deal might be persuaded to sign up to it and at least pass it on condition that it's then put to a, 
a referendum, and I think the chances of that have gone up. But One before of the we go to the referendum, let's just, can we yeah. stick on this for a minute? Yeah, yeah. Because I think there has been a lot of briefing and counter-briefing. One of the really interesting things is the noise is off. Mm -hmm. And you're completely... I mean, the One Nation Tories, up to 50 of them said they couldn't support a Conservative manifesto in a general election, which essentially the party ran on no deal. And the reason they said that is because... If it is a no deal into a general election, the Brexit party have made lots of noises saying they can't support the Conservatives unless it's no deal or, as they are starting to call it, clean Brexit. They have a flair for phraseology. Um, whether these people really mean it, thus far, the One Nation Tories have, that have stayed in the party have been a tower of jelly. So whether they would really go through with it, I don't know. I think they are still desperate to get a deal over the line, almost any deal, which is why I think the referendum point you're comes back into play. So the One Nation Tories are really worried that you'd end up with a Tory party standing on a platform that, even if it wasn't promising no deal, would facilitate commit it. them to it, yeah. facilitate it, and would mean that if they won a general election, won a majority or even the largest party again, they could say, we have a mandate to do this, we have a mandate to crash Britain out. I've also spoken to some of the, the Labour MPs who, although they are sort of softening their red lines, as it were, they've started to say, so long as the EU's happy, we're happy, mm. which is quite interesting in and of itself, yeah. I think. But those Labour rebels are also really worried about the idea of having a general election in which it turns into a proxy Brexit referendum where people vote on lots of other issues and you end up with no deal. Because these Labour rebels, they might be willing to support a deal, they sure as hell are not willing to support a no deal Brexit. So you've but also got they these think they're going to lose. Well, that's right, exactly. I mean, they wouldn't be worried if they thought Jeremy Corbyn was going to sweep, sweep the board, clearly. But I think the other intervention this week that's been interesting is um, Tony Blair, the former Labour Prime Minister, who's always... He has always, we should say, been campaigning for a second referendum on Brexit because he wants to just have remain on the ballot paper and for remain to prevail. But he made a very good point, which is actually a general election where Brexit is just one ingredient in the manifestos. It's a very unclear mandate, and it's not really a just sure. way to settle the problem. So I think the, the voices that are saying, and Simon, saying in let's Labour let's circles... Let's put us here. Sorry, let's interrupt. Let's yeah. put us here. He's, got, he's come back from Brussels with some kind of deal, which he's putting to the House of Commons. He's got to get it voted through, uh, approved, otherwise we're back into no-deal territory. Yeah. So he's put his great deal to the Commons... Boris's deal. This is why you do all the writing, because even I can't <laughs> read my own handwriting. Um, we just look, let me write vote here. Okay. Look, vote. Vote in House of Commons. So how does this happen? He comes back, he's got Ireland squared, he thinks he's got the DUP on board, he thinks he's got a chance. Uh, and yeah. that's, that's what we can discuss yeah. there. He thinks he's got a chance. So what's your premise about how it goes through from here? From a vote where he manages to get it no, through. No, where he's brought it to the House. Yeah. We haven't had the vote yet. You know, there'll be all of these calculations, as we've said, as to, as, as to the advisability of voting for a deal that you might not be 100% hap happy with. I mean, clearly, sort of, groups like the SNP and the Lib Dems will always vote against anyway. But the rest of these groups will be sort of minded to give it support if they think that the next stage is, is possibly a second referendum, if a condition of passing it is then mm -hmm. put it to the people. I mean... You know, clearly the Labour leadership and most of the Conservative Party have always been dead set against another referendum. So the dynamic would have to change. But it is now Labour policy. Well, what's Labour policy and what okay. Labour leadership wants are not necessarily one and Fair the same point. thing because they've been backed into a corner. But yes, you're right, and a lot of the Labour MPs would be would be happy with that. Of course, it might still go down. Last time the referendum was voted on the Commons, it lost by 12 votes. Yeah. Uh, with 60-odd people abstaining. Yeah. So that means, theoretically, the numbers are there. We know that the SNP want a referendum. We know the Liberal Democrats want a referendum. The Welsh Nationalists, the Greens, a spattering of Conservatives. We don't know how many. But they're shifting. Some yep. of them are shifting. I mean, even Ken Clark, yeah. such a significant kind of touchstone figure in this that he's even been mooted as a caretaker Prime Minister, he has started to say we might have to have a second referendum. But I think it's probably fair to say that there's nobody still in the Conservative Party <laughs> voting for a referendum. Right. So it's, it's, it's only that group of 21 that are possible, or well, 20 now, who are possible referendum voters from the Conservative side, but and not all of depend? them. Doesn't that depend? If it becomes an official gambit of the government's... To attach the referendum yeah. to the deal. But I, that's not going to happen, is it? If it's the only way I, to I don't think I don't think Boris Johnson could attach a referendum to the deal. I mean, you don't know. But if he thinks he's got the votes, then he's got the DUP. 
if he has the DUP, he has reduced the hardline Brexit ERG rebels yes. to a sliver. Yes. So the, let's say they're under 10. Let's say there's eight of them. These sort of work in concert, yeah. these two. So let's say there's eight of them. He's mm. got them. That means he needs about 10 or a dozen Labour rebels to get it over the line, probably. And he's also pulled back most of his rebellious Tories. That's the key. That, to me, is the key question, because a large chunk of the rebellious Tories will come back into the fold to vote for a deal, because they were only against no deal. But some of them won't. Quite a lot of them voted for the May deal. That's right. As well, Absolutely. So, yeah. All of them, I think, actually. Maybe, maybe Sam Gima yeah, did a couple of... Couple of so, now, yeah. well, some of those Labour rebels don't like a referendum, they don't want to back a referendum, and but they also don't like the deal that Boris might bring back because it's got fewer protections for workers' rights, environmental regulations, and so on. But you think that an amendment would be t attached to this vote and the th they could actually make it contingent on a referendum? I think it's possible because if you look back at all those awful evenings where we had to sit through the indicative votes earlier in the year, you know, these compromises... They all went down, mm -hmm. as the hard Brexiters keep like to, liking to remind us, you know, that, that Parliament failed to agree on an path, alternative path forward. But they didn't go down by very much, and I think the dynamics could shift quite significantly. Also, I think, as I've said, it's significant that the Labour rebels keep saying now, if it satisfies the EU, it satisfies us. Yeah. So, so it's know, possible. I think, it is, I think it is possible. But it's also possible he could just get it through. Yes, it is possible he could just get it through, in which case this is all... That would just that would then be off. Yes. And we'd and we'd be probably going to a general election. Yes. On the basis of which Boris can say I've quite a strong sold, position then, isn't I've he? Sold, you know, I, my, I've cut through the Gordian knot of Brexit yeah. and I can now unif so unify that, the country. In that outcome, he's in quite a good place. Yeah. Yes, I think that's right. So if he comes back with it, if the deal doesn't happen then, then we're then we're here. Mm. He's failed to get a deal. We've hit the deadline for the Ben Act, which means he is required to seek an extension if the European Union hasn't already just unilaterally offered it earlier. But he's required to seek an extension, which he doesn't want to do. That's where we get into some very, very interesting territory. Um, there's been some fantastic briefings <laughs> out, out of what we have to call a Downing Street aide, uh, Tom Cummings, and who um, essentially all kinds of things, such as he could refuse to leave office, he could challenge the Queen to sack him, some really... Extraordinary stuff. Yes, it's quite fun. That I think it's fun enough that we should put in a little crown, Boris. King Boris. The Queen. <laughs> Boris, look, that's supposed to be the okay. Queen there. The so, crown. There we go. We don't believe this, do we? We don't believe that he's going to defy the Queen to sack him or defy the Ben Act. These are very, very extreme proposals. Mm. You know, they're going to cling on in Downing Street, even if the Constitution says they should be out. Um, I mean, I'm no constitutional lawyer, but it seems like a threat rather than a promise, as my grandma used to say. And uh, I, think, I, think it's, I think it's sabre-rattling, essentially. But I think the reason they feel confident in upping the ante in that way is that they think they're on very strong territory anyway if the vote goes down, mm -hmm. right, and they fail, because they can then go to their precious general election yes. at that point on what they think is this extremely powerful platform of, yeah. we tried, we failed, all of these Remainers, the courts, the MPs, the opposition parties trying to gang up on us. They've tried to frustrate your yes. Brexit, you know, we're the only people you can trust. And then, when, then it gets very worrying for all these other groups, including the One Nation Tories, right? Because it would be a mandate for no deal. So I want to put another idea to you. I mean, I do think that the stuff about, you know, we're going to defy the Queen, it reminded me of that character in Just William who always said, you know, she'd hold her breath until she passed out. That's what it's reminding me of, these absurd, empty threats. But I think there's another thing. One of the things Boris Johnson said, there's going to be a special sitting of the House of Commons on, on a Saturday, Saturday yeah. to thrash everything out. I think if he comes back with no deal, that special sitting could see a separate motion for a referendum, not attached to any specific proposal, but rather like the one that they voted on in April, which simply says, whatever position we end up with in Brexit, it needs to be confirmed by a second vote. I think that could be passed in the Commons at that point, which is why I think your instincts about why the referendum is more likely, I agree with them. I think that's the moment at which all these, pe all these people, the One Nation Tories, the Labour Party, all the other parties, suddenly say, look, we're screaming towards the rocks here. We could be going to an election. And what if Boris wins and then no deal is really back on the cards? Although, if he were to win, it also raises the possibility that then with the, with the no deal mandate, he goes back and is able to get a better deal. But who knows? I think at that moment, that's when they try to push the referendum legislation. Of course, any legislation can be overturned by a new government. 
but it might be tricky. It would also suit the Labour Party because it gets Brexit off of the electoral map when the election gets held and it makes Boris Johnson look much weaker. So the thing we haven't discussed, though, is that if he is forced to ask for an extension from the EU, that could be quite a long extension. There have been some rumours that the EU might be minded to say, well, what's the point of giving the UK another few weeks? They're really in such a mess. We need to give them a decent chunk of time. Mm -hmm. And that potentially would be enough time to, to hold a, a referendum, although you'd have to speed I, I up the whole process. I think this is difficult, because the point is, a very, very short extension is just mm. enough time for a general election, yeah. in, in effect. If you give a long... And we, that's talking about Jan, end of January, second argument. Yeah, but if, been, if they're talking about the end of June, which has been mooted... Or the spring, yeah. OK, all spring. The, the problem is this. I think you still have to have the election rather than the referendum, because you're still... The country's still run by Boris Johnson, and he doesn't want and he has a referendum. No majority. And he has no majority. Yeah. No Queen's speech, no budget. It's a completely preposterous thing. And he, at the same time, is not interested in negotiating the kind of deal that these people want. Mm. So even the June extension, I don't think... I, I think it makes it even harder for the Labour Party to fight an election, uh, for, to, to resist an election. And so I still see it that... Whatever kind of extension you get, I don't know how you can avoid this for that much longer, unless to go back to our original drawing of the other week, yeah. unless you can find the numbers to put a different government in place in the House of Commons. I don't see how you avoid that, even if you manage to put that through the House before you get there. Well, also, even if, on the off chance you could put together this caretaker government, that's not, an un that's not a sustainable not government. And, in fact, it's been explicitly said that it would only be, you know, for, a, for a short period of time to call a referendum or an election. So, you know, you couldn't limp on till next summer with a caretaker government. That would be absolutely no, I, possible. No, I, I can't see it either. But it does require the Labour Party to follow through and say we would have an election straight after we've got the delay. And there are increasingly loud and important voices in the Labour Party telling Jeremy Corbyn not to. It's not just backbenchers. We know that members of the Shadow Cabinet, John McDonnell, Emily Thornbury, are voicing concerns about this. So they're in a bit of a bind too. The one thing that is really hard to say, really hard to call, is if any of this column comes right, whether it's his deal or a referendum vote, what impact that then has on a general yes. election? Because lots of parties have built their strategy around Brexit Absolutely. being a fundamental part, and this happening before Brexit, not least the Liberal Democrats, of course. And if it happens after, that's a whole new ballgame. So the, it, if it was me designing the way out, yes. I'd say, why not have a general election and a referendum on the same day? Interesting. And then you separate... But what's the referendum on? Well, the referendum is one of these compromises where everybody, with regret, passes the deal on the, on the condition that it's put back to the but people. But do you think if... Um, the one problem with the referendum... Because that forces... Well, the reason if, why, as a voter, I would like that to happen, OK, is then course. you get to make up your mind based on the other issues yes. as to who you want to be in power... And how you feel on Brexit. Yes, yeah, so if you're a Labour Brexiter or a Conservative Remainer, you can have the best of both worlds. But if that referendum terms are decided before an election, and we know it's not a quick thing to get a referendum up and running, then a lot of Conservatives will insist on no deal being in that referendum set of choices. So that makes it more complicated. They will probably try to resist votes for 16-year-olds, although I guess if you've got the majority to force a referendum into the equation, you've probably got the majority to force the terms of it. There we go. OK, I'm literally now more confused than I was at the start. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I think I've just solved the you Brexit solved it. conundrum. So it's a referendum it's a on the same day as general election. On the same election. day, having passed a compromise deal. What, ha but what would happen <laughs> if the general election returned Boris Johnson on a no-deal manifesto with us having voted to stay in? No, because you, you take Brexit out of the manifestos. Right. By but decree they're, of But they're me. still the government by the decree of you. OK. Yep. I think it's Queen Miranda then. Excellent. I'd vote for that. It's called the Pot to Serve. <laughs> <laughs>